Aloha, everybody. I'm Richard Emery. I'm your host for today's Condo Insider Show. And many of you know that for a long time, I've been a member of the Legislative Action Committee, um, the Hawaii Council of Community Associations, Board of Directors, and have been actively engaged in issues affecting association living in Hawaii. I recently was appointed to the National Task Force by Community Association Institute looking at defining public policy with regard to reserve studies. And this all stems from the collapse of the Surfside condominium in Florida, which now every legislature across the country is looking for ways to get credit for introducing a bill on how they will single-handedly solve this problem with respect to condominiums and mandating condominium inspections and mandating engineering reports and things along that line. So I wanna talk about that because it's been an interesting, I just had a third committee meeting today. It's been interesting to hear from all the different states, the different problems they have and how their legislatures uh, approach this particular issue. For example, in uh, one of the counties next to Surfside County in Florida, their city council has already passed a rule that if you're a condominium and you get an engineering report on your building for any purpose, you have to provide a copy to the building department of that county. Now, um, we, a couple of years ago in Hawaii, uh, had a bill established that they wanted to mandate structural engineering uh, valuations of buildings over 10 stories every five years. And, the, both the building department as well as the industry uh, fought that because it's too often and structural issues sometimes are hidden. It doesn't necessarily solve the problem. And every time they, they pass one of these things of mandatory structural inspections, mandatory sprinkler systems, mandatory this, mandatory that, they indirectly make condominiums too expensive to live in. And we're not sure that they satisfy what the original issue was. You know, in the case of the condo association in Surfside, it had nothing to do with the reserve study. They identified they had building cracks and they had engineers look at the building cracks and they had government officials say, yes, it's a problem, but it's not that bad. <clears throat> the problem was that the owners under their, their requirements would never approve a loan to fix the building. And so the industry was looking at that and this national task force. And one of the questions was, should we as an industry support or not support owners' rights to prevent a building repair from being made? And overwhelmingly, the people in this uh, task force said, no, the, you have to fix the building. The law shouldn't allow owners to opt out of fixing the building because they don't want to spend the money. Uh, it was just catastrophic with loss of life in, in Florida. It may not be as bad as somewhere else, but uh, it th doesn't make sense, you know. And the other issue came up was developers. Well, should developers be required to do a reserve study on new buildings? And the consensus, again, was 90% said yes. They just can't improperly or artificially give owners estimate of maintenance fees that don't have any real basis for what the real reserve contribution should be, meaning you get owners to buy with one expectation, only to find out once they do a reserve study, more money is required, and then they don't wanna go along with it because that wasn't in their original budget. So should developers be required to provide accurate estimates of maintenance fees, including reserve contributions? And should reserve contributions be by national standards? And everybody overwhelmingly said, this is true. The problem is when you start getting all these different states, some people were saying, well, the reserve study has to be done by a licensed reserve professional. Okay, well, how about a two unit condominium or a 20 unit condominium that only has a road? Are you gonna impose that requirement on smaller condominiums? Is someone the task force said, yes, it has to be a licensed professional and they have to pay the money. Well, uh, Hawaii, you know, uh, let's the board uh, they have to do a reserve study by law, but it lets the, the board do the reserve study if they feel it's appropriate based on the 
size and complexity of the association. So it's been very eye-opening, this whole thing. But what I've learned is I've participated in many, many, many issues on uh, national level of how associations should be run is that number one, one size doesn't fit all. Number two, every state kind of addresses this a little differently. Uh, most states, uh, I think there's only 10 states that have a mandatory reserve law. And, but now that we have this attention because of the building collapse, I can see all this stuff coming out of the woodworks that we're gonna have to find a uh, acceptable measure to deal with this. And I give CAI a lot of credit for setting up a task force to look at a national policy and what we feel is appropriate, recognizing all the one size doesn't fit all type of issues. But that led me into my thoughts that, and I'm gonna apologize in the beginning, you might find it interesting to see some of the most recent legislation or litigation across the country on condo or association issues, and what the results were in other states, and then maybe give you a little short comparison with how that would have maybe worked in Hawaii. And my apology is gonna be because I have to look at the, the uh, nine examples I have here, and hopefully we can get through all the nine examples. Um, I have to look and I want to read two or three sentences so I don't get this wrong. So I'm gonna look down from the screen while I read this to you and I apologize. And, uh, but it's the only way I can figure out how to do this. But this is this month's 2021, August, notable legal decisions. The first one, in Channel View East, Condominium Association versus Ferguson, the Michigan Court of Appeals ruled that neither the Michigan Condominium Act nor the association's bylaws permitted the association to file a lien against the unit for unpaid fines. Now, that's an interesting situation because the key words are unpaid fines and a lien was filed. You may remember last year when we talked about Act 187, this 187, where associations here in Hawaii used to have a pay first dispute later. So association can find someone and you had no legal right to dispute that unless you paid it first. And so if you didn't pay it, then in the old days, association would put pressure on you by foreclosing on you, then by non-judicial foreclosure. Well, the law was changed in Hawaii. And the difference is that the association certainly has the right to put a lien on you in Hawaii and foreclose on you if you aren't paying common assessments, maintenance fees, special assessments to apply to everybody. On the other hand, other charges against you, such as a fine or a late fee or a legal fee, they don't have the ability under Hawaii law to put a lien on your unit without first offering you the right to mediation. And the mediation must be conducted within 60 days. So if you get a mediation request, I wouldn't ignore it because if in fact you go through mediation and you're unable to solve it, then in fact they can pursue the issue of collecting uh, the fine, although they can't put a lien on your unit and foreclose on it. And everything I just said doesn't apply to active service members in Hawaii. You can see the problem is kind of common across the country where associations want to find people and they want leverage because it's, it's a $50 fine. There's not much leverage to get people to pay it, but they got to have people follow the rules. It's kind of a common problem on how to deal with it. And in Hawaii, I've already discussed what it is. Uh, the board's got to give you the right to mediation and they have to be mediated within 60 days. So if you're an owner and you think you're going to stall them out forever, that's not going to work. <clears throat> So then Hawaii, then they can pursue a collection action uh, against you with exclusive of foreclosure. And, 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 and certainly they can get a judgment in court uh, theoretically for you. But the best thing is to try to work with your board and to get it to happen. But that was the Michigan case. <clears throat> Let's look at the next case. In Hunter versus Catalano, the Florida Court of Appeals held that the Florida Homeowner Association Act did not require a dispute between homeowners to be mediated. 
Well, it's kind of a similar situation that uh, uh, the Association of Pot of Mediation in Florida against the owner. They didn't want to go to mediation and, uh, and uh, they made a request that uh, uh, they went to uh, court and the court of, court of court appeals said the way their Florida Act was written, it didn't require them to do mediation. Well, you know, in Hawaii, it's mandatory. Mediation is mandatory by the board. It's mandatory by the person following the mediation, which should be an owner in this case. So you don't have a choice. You have to go to mediation. And yeah, you cannot show up, and but you're going to be in violation. And under Hawaii law, they could then say, I'm filing a motion in court to force you to go to mediation. And if the judge agrees, you're going to have to pay all the legal fees they had by statute for not showing up and going to mediation and forcing the association or the owner forcing the association to file a claim in court to force you to go to mediation. But you can see this alter dispute thing is, is a problem nationwide. And, and frankly, Hawaii gives you more options than any state I know. They give you facilitative mediation, evaluative mediation, non-binding arbitration. And yes, you can go to a board meeting and just have a talk story session before you file litigation. So you have lots of ways to resolve disputes here. <clears throat> Most prevalent being a value to mediation, which is uh, funded by the Real Estate Commission here in Hawaii. And you have to pay half of the first hour of the mediator's time, about 175 bucks. Under a value to mediation, that judge can take the judge off, retired judge, takes the gloves off and tells each party directly what he thinks and tries to drive a resolution to the problem. Very successful here in a way. The third case is May versus Spokane County. The Washington State Court of Appeals ruled that the court order was sufficient to declare a discriminatory covenant <laughs> void without physically altering the recorded documents. The court noted that even though a state law provided a mechanism for doing so, erasing a historic record of racism would be a dangerous because it risks forgetting and denying the horrible truths of racism. <clears throat> so in this case, what happened, there was a court order uh, regarding discrimination, but the governing documents were never changed to record the discriminatory language was in the governing documents. And this court ruled, rightfully so, that the fact that the documents were um, not amended and, and corrected to correct the proper discrimination language had no effect on the court's order and future discrimination claims that the court order would trump the fact that they weren't in the documents. The fact you didn't put them in your documents doesn't give you um, a reason to look at that one discriminatory conduct and claim that the association lost as a single issue within the court when the court basically ruled that the governing documents were, were uh, unconstitutional and uh, requiring us. So that's a basically a written argument about uh, uh, whether you have to, uh, if you have a court judgment or a court order, uh, is it only limited to the one case you just tried or is it do you have a problem down the road that because uh, um, the documents were amended that uh, you, you still committed discriminatory practice because you haven't corrected this? And the, the Florida court said, yes, probably rightfully so. Seems to me pretty logical if your governing documents are, are uh, unconstitutional or violate state law uh, that you can't enforce them, number one. Number two, that holds out to now and everybody in the future. And yeah, you should amend your documents, but whether you did amend your documents or not, doesn't affect the order of the or court and, and future claims. So pretty interesting, but uh, pretty predictable in that case. And we'll do one more, then we're gonna take a short break. In Turin Mills LLC versus Leisure Acres Association. I'm not making up these names, by the way, this is exactly what it is. The Indiana Court of Appeal ruled that a property owner lost the right to complain about the association enforcing their covering documents because the owner had complied with them for 13 years. So anyway, I have a similar case I'm an expert in right now that where an owner buys in and wants to go back and say, 
procedures you used when you amended your documents 10 years ago were incorrect. And so these documents don't apply to me. I know it's hard to believe people say that. But in this case, you have a situation where the government documents are there, they're provided to you when you moved in, you comply with them for 13 years, and then you try to say, well, they're not proper. And in this case, the court said, too late. You bought in. I don't know what the statute of limitations is on these issues, but uh, you bought in, you comply with it for 13 years, we're throwing your case out of court because you, uh, um, this case is uh, clear. You understood them, you complied with them. You never raised the issue before. Now, because things have changed, you want to not comply with them. So you, you sued the association. And uh, at the end of the day, that owner was said, Sayonara, you've lost. So on that note, we're going to take a one minute break. So I can again get myself organized. And I apologize for having to look down and read this, but I'll, I won't get it right. I don't do that. So we'll be back in one minute and review a couple more cases and call it a day and look for a bottle of wine. Rusty Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We've been talking a little bit about the Surfside condominium and, and the reserves and all the issues that are going to surface out of that legally and otherwise. And then on top of that, I said I want to share some of the most recent notable legal decisions across the country and what the courts ruled in other states and kind of related to Hawaii and how it kind of fits in. And um, I'm not gonna apologize anymore, but I've got to read these things so I get them accurate. So here we go. Westgate Town Home Association versus Curse. The Illinois Appellate Court ruled that the association board was not protected by the business judgment rule when it decided an owner violated the rules because the board failed to provide the owner all of the evidence of the alleged violation. So understand what this says. So the board went after an owner for alleged violations of the rules, but refused to provide him any evidence on how they came up with that conclusion. And the board took the position, well, it's our business judgment. It wasn't necessary to tell the owner what he did wrong. I know you're probably looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, did he make this up? No, I didn't make this up. But the court said the board, because the owner was seeking damages because he's saying, I'm entitled to know what the fine is and what I cause, and I'm right to a hearing. And, and they wouldn't tell me if it was the business judgment rule, they just fined me. Now, I don't care where you're from. I know we're a, a very liberal state and very uh, much in the protecting owner's rights, which I agree with, by the way. Um, but does that make sense to anybody? I mean, when I read that, I had to read it a couple of times. It's like, you're telling me I'm going to find you, but I'm not going to tell you what, what caused us to give you the fine. But the fine stands on its own merit. You did whatever you did, and, and we didn't provide you any evidence or anything because it was our judgment it wasn't necessary. That doesn't sound very American to me. But anyway, the point, I'd say don't try that in Hawaii. That's not going to go very far because, you know, house rules have been religiously uh, overturned by the courts when owners weren't given a right to appeal and weren't given all the information. And, and in many cases, house rules were declared moot 
Uh, in some cases, they were declared that house rules were abandoned. You can't enforce any of the house rules because the board didn't follow a proper protocol on exercising its house rules and its fine policy, giving everybody a right to appeal. Everybody should have a right to appeal. And it's pretty common sense to me that, uh, but anyway, I, I find some of these things hard to believe. In fact, some of the ones coming up, I find hard to believe. Let me give you another one. All right. Jeffrey Moyes versus the Williamsburg Townhouse Corpor Cooperative. The Michigan Court of Appeals ruled that a housing cooperative wasn't liable for a resident's injuries from slipping and falling on an icy sidewalk in a common area because wintry conditions should have alerted the resident of the potential risk. So anyway, it's snowing heavily in Michigan. I thought Waynesburg would be Virginia, but anyway, it's snowing heavily and the guy goes outside, he slips on the sidewalk in a snowy, icy condition, and he sues the association for the injuries. And the Michigan Court of Appeals said, no, you knew it was snowing out there, it's icy. You know, the associations can't have every sidewalk clean all the time, every second. They're not liable. You knew the risk when you went out there and people who walk on icy, roads and streets and sidewalks should be careful. It's not their responsibility. I'm a little surprised that in some ways the insurance just didn't step in the liability insurance and pay the guy off. You know, I mean, um, it's, um, it's most associations would have liability insurance. Now, certainly I would tell you if the sidewalk was damaged and, and it was broken or had tilted or something, was with needed repair that the associate was responsible for, it may not have had the same result. But here they're saying based on weather conditions, you know, and I, I guess it's kind of like if you go outside on your sidewalk during a hurricane and you get hit by a coconut, that it's responsibility of the association because the coconut blew off the tree and hits you on the sidewalk. You should have known better. I guess this is a should have known better case with the, uh, the Williamsburg thing, but they ruled. I'm actually surprised in some cases that people file these lawsuits because if you know what I'm saying, these are all from appeals courts, which means they had an underlying judgment from a trial court before this. I have a case right now in Kauai where the, 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 the public path is on private property, but it's, it's a weird set of circumstances. The association owns it. They have an easement with the city, but it's not quite clear the documents. But anyway, They've had several injuries. So the county approved putting up the two signs, one at the entrance and one at the very top. And they're saying, this is a dangerous trail. The county has closed it. Do not proceed high risk. And I've now had two injuries on that trail. People saying, well, I saw the sign, but other people were doing it. So I thought it was okay. And I broke my ankle in three places. I don't know what's going to happen with the insurance and the courts yet, but I mean, give me a break, you know, there's two big signs saying, no, the trail's closed, it's dangerous. But they climb around the sign and the fence and they go down and then trip and fall and break three places in their ankle. And it's like, how'd that happen? Must be the association's fault. Anyway, onward. Board of Directors of Winnet Park Condominium versus Bordage. The Illinois Appeals Court ruled the fines and legal costs were improperly billed to an owner because the board did not set a reasonable date and time for a hearing and didn't give the owner any notice. That's going back to what I said earlier on the other case. You have these fines, you have to notice the owner and they're entitled to a hearing. And most people should say, if you want to appeal this, you have, I don't know what Illinois rules are as collecting fines. I know in Hawaii, you can collect fines, but you have to have this mediation and you have to give the notice and they have to have a right to a hearing and you have to go through some steps. But in this case, the association didn't give the owner any notice of when the hearing would be and went ahead and executed on the fine anyway. I know, I can't believe this happens. You know, I always said to people, when I talk to all these task force I'm on, you know, Hawaii is kind of like the melting pot of the future of condominiums. We have 1,800 condominiums in Hawaii, and I've seen about everything you can imagine in lawsuits and arbitrations and disputes. But 
Anyway, moving along to Harmony House Westlake LLC versus Parkstone Property Owners Association. Federal case, the US Court of Appeals ruled that allowing a sober living facility to operate in a community restricted to single family residents was a necessary accommodation under the Federal Fair Housing Act, but the sober living facility operator failed to justify the number of residents desired there. And we kind of see that with, uh, um, uh, what do I call it, the child care facilities. People in a single family uh, homeowner association want to have a child care facility. And this case was a sober living facility. And what the federal court says, well, you know, it's a reasonable accommodation for that owner to come to the association and say, I want to operate a sober community facility. But what the owner didn't do is justify. So it's kind of a partial win, partial lot didn't justify the number of people he wanted to have in the home and, and those types of things. But, you know, we always see these discrimination issues on, under fair housing. And we caution boards all the time to be careful about when they get these complaints for emotional support animals or parking stalls or things, to be very careful what they're doing. And, and we suggest they talk with their lawyer because we have the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission here whose job is to defend the rights of the disabled. And I support that. We need to defend their rights. But there's a lot of touch and go stuff when I see some of these claims that go through this. But in this case, it was real. Having a, a facility was to deemed a reasonable accommodation. But on the other hand, the operator didn't justify how many people he would be allowed to have in his facility. Moving along, I'm running out of time. The last one is Isson Hall versus Shadow Glen Homeowners Association. The California Court of Appeals ruled an association was not liable for injuries to a visitor walking across the street after parking on a busy road because guest parking was not available. Pretty self-explanatory. Guest parking wasn't available in the condo. He parked in a busy road, walked across the street, got hit. It's not the association's fault that the guest parking was full. So I hope you guys are all amazed at some of the stupid cases I see. I'm just, I'm just amazed at some of the things that people think they can say, but uh, maybe it's the lawyer's fault because I think the lawyers are, well, if, if, they got, if they got a client, I'll give them a check, they'll take any case. But the reality of this is that um, that's kind of the kind of legal stuff that's going on. I would tell you, you can expect next year's Hawaii legislature to address the engineering issues of Surfside and reserve studies and developers' responsibilities. Not sure it'll go anywhere, but uh, uh, we as an industry monitor all the lawsuits across the country and try to uh, educate our boards and owners, as well as uh, uh, promote proper laws, rules, and regulations that defend our industry. And on that note, I want to thank you for tuning in today. I hope you learned something and we hope you enjoy our show, Condo Insider. And we'll have another show next week, Thursday, 3 p.m. And thanks to all of our supporters who make this show possible. Aloha.